So thank you for being here. I think we're going to get started. It's about 6 o'clock. Um, I guess, is it not getting recorded then? Yep, he's, we're on. We're on? Oh, he's we're on. You're on. Okay, great. Um, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, Susanna Mizell Hugs is not able to be here today, so I'm Heather Altenberg, the Vice Chair, and um, sitting in for her place. Uh, can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I want to start off by saying thank you for coming today, for being here. There were, uh, I heard about 11 people this morning at the 9 o'clock forum. Um, so we were pleased to be able to offer a daytime forum as well as an evening forum, hoping to maximize uh, the amount of contact that we could have with people and offer multiple opportunities. So thank you for showing up. We have had, hi. We have had, um, quite a while that we've been working on this budget and we just wanted to give you a short quick overview of the process thus far and it really started I would say with administrators back in the fall mm -hmm. as they start contemplating um, I think the first meetings that the school board had with the administrators was back in February and we've had eight or nine meetings leading up to it the beginning started with their presentation of what they felt was needed in the budget uh, and as we looked at certain numbers, we contemplated what the district would look like, what the programs would look like if we were to cut those numbers back. Um, we had quite a bit of discussion um, about what that would look like and how that would feel as a district. And last night was our, our vote. So that's the overall process. They've been video tape, they've been filmed for transparency, for them to be out and open and public. We've offered multiple times opportunities for people to write in to the school board or to the superintendent with their questions. Um, and we're holding the, these meetings this morning and today to continue with that opportunity to speak with you, to answer your questions, uh, and to try to make this as clear as we can and help you understand as best you can. And by no means is this it. If there are any questions to follow, please know that uh, emails are always welcome. John? So, so um, again, I'd just like to cover a few things before we begin to give an overview of, of what's going on to date. We've tried to be as open and transparent and participatory as we can be. We've had, like I said, eight meetings, uh, public meetings, uh, uh, workshops on the budget. Um, uh, public input to date has been limited. I think over those eight meetings, we've had less than 10 citizens who uh, spoke or asked questions. Um, more probably like five. We had some invited guests who spoke. Uh, we received, I believe, three questions by email. All of those have been, or, or when, have been responded to. I think we see, received one recently that's in process of being responded to. So that, uh, uh, I'm gonna sort of cover a little bit of a summary of what went on at those uh, eight different budget workshops. Um, and uh, also just note, uh, this is, like I said, this has not been an easy budget year. This is also a year for our schools where there's been a significant amount of change. Uh, we changed, uh, we have three schools and we changed top administrators in two of those schools this year. Um, we uh, uh, have now found a permanent superintendent and we we'll look forward to her joining us in June. It has been a long process and we're delighted that we uh, think we have found the person that will be with us for quite some time. I will say we've been delighted to have Howard Coulter as our interim superintendent, and I uh, can't stress enough, as I said earlier, there's a great deal of value in having someone who has been around education and around Maine in particular to come to your district and look at it with a pair of fresh eyes. I think he called our attention to a number of things that needed attention. Uh, there are things that you do that you don't realize that you do that often need attention, and Howard has called our attention to those, and I think we've begun to make progress on those. One of those things in particular is the facilities. 
Um, and we spent some time at our budget workshops speaking about a, a facility study that we engaged in that looked at making some substantial uh, improvements to our current facilities. Um, to, uh, that, pro that project uh, looked at making changes at Pond Cove, at the cafetorium, at the entrances, and some of the things uh, at the weight room at the high school. There's a great, there's a bunch of detailed information about what was proposed is on the budget, is on the, is in the budget materials. Um, these would be actually improvements, not just spending on capital projects to stay where we're at. The previous capital improvements, called capital improvements, were actually just designed to keep us where we're at. We had some bond issues that rolled off a few years ago. We increased the operating budget of the schools, as I understand it, to, but again, the design of those, of that spending was to keep the, keep the roofs in order, keep what we had in order. There were not actually substantial improvements uh, that were really slated to, to occur in, under, those, under that capital improvement budget. So this project looked at about uh, $27 million ballpark of improvements, uh, the, and they estimated that the engineering that would re be required to take it to the point, uh, the level of specificity and pricing that it would be needed before you were able to send that out for a bond would be about $750,000. And as much as we thought that this was a really overdue thing to do this budget year, that was not a number that we felt we could handle. And we put it off to the side. In fact, we inquired to see if that was something that we could bring uh, as a separate Warren article to really get public input on that um, separately from the operating budget. Uh, that was not possible. Then we had the one bit of, I think has been good news in this entire budget cycle is we worked with the engineer and asked them to see what they could do. And they came back to us and said that they would be willing to go at risk for $500,000 of that $750,000 in round numbers. Um, that was a big deal. So if the project did not go forward, they would never get paid that money. That would be rolled into the cost of the bond if it goes forward. This is really unusual. This is not something that they do all the time or ever. Um, it is not something that we really expected. But looking at that, um, we had been in the process. We sharpened our pencil. We went back, and if you'll see, and there's a handout in the back that sort of talks about the budget changes, and this walks through the budget changes from our initial proposed budget to our current proposed budget. And you'll see that we got down to uh, a 2.1% budget increase. And that's a pretty low number. It's historically much lower than school budgets have increased. And then, we added in two additional items that really needed to be addressed. Last year, we thought we added a custodian to, to our, our, our budget, and we, um, uh, it's a long explanation as to what happened, but we still remain at the school significantly understaffed, and it's problematic. We added back a custodian, and we added in those $250,000 of engineering fees where the engineering firm will put itself at risk. And that brings us to our total tonight, which is uh, a three point 1% total budget increase. So what we covered at the workshops as we went through those different parts of the budget, we covered what's happening with enrollment and what's been happening recently with enrollment. Our enrollments have essentially been flat. For the last couple years, we've been around 1,600 students, plus or minus five or 10. Uh, we expect it to remain flat, although last year we had a, uh, may not be true, last year we had a historically low kindergarten incoming class of 80, our numbers were still flat. Uh, this year, I think uh, Jason Mangiri has told me that they've already had over 100 registrations for kindergarten. So, uh, but we have forecast this budget as if uh, that we will be flat um, going forward. So, you know, uh, you may have heard our enrollment is dropping. It has dropped some, but it is dropping at a really, really low rate. It's been uh, less than 1% changes for, met for, for quite some time and essentially flat a few students here or there under, under 1% for the last couple of years. So our headcounts, our headcounts and personnel are also essentially flat. After going back and sharpening our pencil, they're down just a little bit. But our personnel costs are up a little bit and that's because, as we covered before, over 80% of our budget uh, this year and in recent years is, sub, is a personnel cost related to collective bargaining agreements. 
and it's gone up because we've shaved everything down. There's a percentage of the budget. So this year, and the, with the staffing that we have and the, the collective bargain agreements we have, personnel costs are up, at least in the initial budget, uh, maybe, I don't know if the percentage changed, but it was uh, up about 4.2%. And I haven't checked back, but the town's initial budget, I believe, personnel costs for them were up about 4.7%. Um, it's not really an apples to apples comparison. I think their headcount or at least initially was rising. I'm not exactly sure of that. I'm happy to check back. But we're certainly within the same range or lower. Um, so uh, I will say the other thing that I was really happy about, and we had talked about this in the uh, budget workshops, is I was really happy to see the town council. We're cognizant of the, the tax raise that this may cause. We can manage the expense side of the budget. We have a lot of control over that. We have much less control over what happens at the state funding side. Um, and I'll, I'll give up. A brief overview because I think it's important. When the legislature spent more money on education this year, which is what they, they did, they spent more money overall than last year on education. Excuse me, John, can I yep. just interrupt one second? Um, as maybe you can um, say it very quickly so that we can open yep. this up to the public so that it can sure. be a question answer sure. forum uh, like it was intended to be. So maybe so, a, another uh, minute or so, please. I'm on my last point. <laughs> because I thought the state funding piece was actually important to understand. When they increased overall spending for the budget for on education, they also increased by a larger amount what they were requiring essentially all schools to spend. So the difference between what they increased in funding versus what they required on spending created a deficit, which is why, although they overall spent more money, many districts find themselves with less this year. And that falls harder on those who uh, are, are low receivers to begin with. Um, each town's funding form, is, district's town funding formula is different, but on a big picture basis, that's why the mill, expected mill rate that is so critical to the school funding number went up so much, is to fund that difference between what they were requiring people to spend and what they funded. Um, I was delighted, to, on, on that point, I was delighted to see that this year the town council is beginning to address uh, potential tax relief for those who are uh, seniors and those on fixed incomes. This is something that has come up uh, over and over again, and it is something that we are acutely aware of as well, and it is not something that we have much control to do, so I was happy to see the town council begin to address that. So with that, um, if you have questions about what's in the budget, um, we'd love to hear from you. So um, if you do have questions, we just ask that you come to the podium, uh, say your name, uh, your address. And just to reiterate, since the vote was just last night by the school board, that our budget increase is a 3.1%. Mm -hmm. um, and that if you're not familiar, that um, um, I think it's 82% of that is already negotiated in contracts uh, with teachers. So there's very little wiggle room around that. Um, that tax impact is a 10.2%, which we recognize is quite large. Uh, and there are all these reasons for why it is that way, but we believe in it, and so that's why we voted that in. And that is one of the reasons that we are opening this to try to answer your questions. So we're here for you. And if anybody wants to ask, we're willing to listen. Hi, I'm Jesse Timberlake, uh, I live in Oak Crest Road. Would you explain to me again um, the difference in uh, state funding and what we're required to spend? I don't really understand that. Um, so I could try and give a brief overview. It's a, a, like m most states across the, the country, uh, education is funding according to a state funding formula. Um, Maine has a, has a funding formula. It has a number of different inputs to it. Um, it's rather complex. Some parts of it are straightforward. Other parts of it are less straightforward. Um, there's a piece of it that relates to how many students you have and what the expectations of headcounts are. And then there's, some, there's regional adjusters. And they, adjust fact, they change the formula every year in the legislature. They make adjustments just about every year. Um, to the different parts of it um, in terms of um, 
regional adjustments and and what they're going to count and what what they're what, and they come up with an amount that each district is required to spend on the essential programs and services, which are they call that, in order to receive state funding. So they say, and then they say, okay, you if you have to spend this much, and then we expect your required local share to be this much. Okay. The, um, the required local share is based on uh, what they, uh, a district's ability to pay as they calculate it. That consists of the expected mill rate, which as I sort of explained at a very macro level, that went up significantly. That's then applied against the district's uh, valuation of property. Uh, and, for the, and this year that also changed the formula. It was previously a three-year average. This year it was a two-year average. And Cape Elizabeth property has been rising relatively rapidly. So you take the large increase in the expected mill rate and the large increase in our property valuation, which they're doing every year, which in the town only revalues every five to ten years. And their determination is that our ability to pay um, is substantially higher. And so when you subtract the expected local share from that piece, that piece, your funding goes down. Okay, I get it, thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Lynn and I live at 54 Cranbrook Drive. I'm strictly here as a citizen because no counselor should ask this dumb of a question, but I don't understand why the school board is a 3.1% increase and the municipal is essentially flat. How does that get to 10.2? So why is 10.2% increase going out to the taxpayers when the school's adding 3.1? So that's not a net tax impact. That's the tax impact of the school's change in the school's portion of the tax. 3.1. Um, 3.1 is our expense change. Mm -hmm. When you roll that through in terms of what's the tax impact on the school portion of the overall tax, that's a 10% change in, the, in that piece. So the total tax is the town piece plus the school piece. We're only referring to the, the school piece. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So you would add that or you, you would, that would come together with the town piece to have a total impact and we don't have those figures. So how'd you get to 10.2? May I answer that? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Catherine Messmer, I'm the business manager. There is a difference between our expenditure side versus our revenue side. And the increase of 3.1 is purely the increase based on what we spent last year. That's just the expenditure side. And then on the revenue side, we use state subsidy to help calculate um, how much the tax impact would be. We lost almost 900,000 in state subsidy, so when we lose state subsidy, the only other place it really can go is to um, an increase to local taxes. So our subsidy went down almost a million, so local taxes go up to offset it. So that's why there's a difference between the budget increase and the tax rate increase. In a, in a, Overall so I, I, I will say you know, th this year we could not, in past years we've absorbed some of that with our unassigned fund balance. Okay, that was. Okay, we had built that up partly to handle the unreliability of state funding. After a $400,000 cut and a $700,000 cut, there's nothing, and we again reduced it again, 400, you know, $400,000 this year. There's nothing left to reduce. <laughs> It's okay, dry. In other words, it's very simply, because last year it seemed to me it was about the same level of increase. It always seems relatively constant. Salaries go up, health benefits. I mean, this year was worse, but, and last year we lost a whole lot of state funding too. So that's why I did, and last year's increase was something that seemed mildly palatable and there wasn't this brouhaha. And so that's why I was confused why this year it seemed to jump so dramatically when nothing really very big on the expenditure side seems to have changed. And you're essentially saying it's because last year you used a significant amount of your fund balance and I think you also used some money you got back from some health 
Right. I forget. Mm -hmm. yes. Health benefits. Yes. Yeah. So, so that you were able to kind of compensate for what the state didn't give us, but this year essentially like the banks run dry and there's not that that any amount that you have in savings. Well, exactly. right. yeah. so, uh, if I could just join in. Um, you, you asked a question earlier about why the increase on um, expenses, uh, expenses going up 3.1, why apparently the town is going up 1%, you said? Well, I, I, it's, it seems, again, right. like last year. I, I, don't have, I have no knowledge about the town side. What, what drives our expenses largely um, are salaries going up. They're going up about the same amount, honestly, every year. It's, a, it's something close to between two and two and a half, two and three quarter percent. That's kind of just across the board, those are going up. What's different this year in health benefits, which is a very large part of, of, of our expenses each year, is that like last year, we budgeted 8% as, as, a, as a thing that would be a safe point to be when our rates have usually been between 3 to 5. Um, and they actually came in at 9. So that cost to us was an additional, um, what was it? It was big. What, what was it? The, the additional cost due to health insurance? The health, yeah. the, and that was, 9%. Yeah, so it's $283,000. Um, that's what it cost us to, 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 to go to nine. That, so that means that for us it's nearly two or three times as much and no extra money to, to offset at the end of the, end, end of the season to um, lower taxes. The, um, the other thing that's in this budget is it's a one-time expense is this money for the um, architect study. That would normally not be there. That's I think 200 and uh, $250,000. That, um, that's an, an unusual situation, but it's the board's belief, and I, I agree with this, that this is an opportunity and we shouldn't lose that um, to move ahead with, with a study that would really hopefully address the buildings. So those are large parts of what's different about the, on, on, on the expense side. So it's sort of a, a culmination of several factors yep. that's created sort of the perfect storm. And yep. my other question, which I know has no answer, but I just will ask it anyway. Last year we went through a lot of this and then the state actually really late in the game gave us back or gave us some of what, and so right. we ended up being able to return some of that to the taxpayers. And right. so I sort of felt like all that <laughs> arguing maybe could have been avoided. Did you anticipate that might happen again this year, where the state's like, well, oh, look, we, we have extra we, money? We met uh, um, maybe a month ago with Senator Millett, and um, she uh, left me with the impression that um, count on nothing, um, being any uh, end, end of the year surprise uh, for, for the better. Just expect what you that, um, have heard will be the cut will be the cut. So we aren't um, nearly as optimistic as we were wishing to be about that. So it, it's still possible, but it's partly unlikely, partly due to the, the legislative cycle, the two-year budget cycle, and the how when the legislature's in session and what they address. So last year was a year where it was more possible to happen. Uh, this year is less possible, particularly with what's like the, with the way the current legislature is constructed and people eyeing uh, other races in the fall. I also think there's a... A risk factor there. I mean, we were kind of banking on the uh, insurance coming in quite a bit lower, and that was a huge surprise to us. And now it's at nine percent, and we we just can't take that risk with the overall budget and assume that the state is going to come to our rescue. We have to plan for it not being, right. unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Thompson, uh, Six Pine Ridge Road. Uh, I've got a couple of questions and then um, just an observation, but uh, is the budget up on the school board some, somewhere? Because I have been, it, yes. it is, okay. Because I haven't, I haven't been able to find it yet, but it's up there now? It, it has been for several months. It's, it can be a little hard to get to. You have to go through the school board and then there's a drop down menu and it says budget information and that will take you to several years um, budget information. But it's okay. all, I try to make sure it's updated every day. Okay, all right, thank you. I'll take another look okay. at that. 
One of the things that I think we could, it would be good if we could do a better job of explaining the, because even, even with your handout tonight uh, on enrollment, that doesn't look flat. And so when, when we have articles in the paper that are talking about it being flat, as, as John has mentioned earlier, but then you see graphs like this, and these are all over the place. You, you know, you have people out there are, are, I think they're a little bit confused about, is the population flat? And then you hear, well, the, the kindergarten uh, enrollment class was, was 80 students this year. Um, and it, there are, there are, there's a fair, fair amount of data out there that the zero to five population has dropped by 50%. And so I think if we could do a better job of explaining to the townspeople what really is this, the story, because it, in the last 10 years it's gone from 1,850 students to 1,600. Uh, that, I think, uh, along with staffing, I think a little bit more explanation on staffing. I know staffing, is it, it still isn't about the same as it was at the peak in, 10 years ago when the student population was 1850, but I think along the way we added all day kindergarten, so there's people right. there. But I, I think the, pop, the school population and, and a little bit more data on where is that going, uh, I think would be a little bit helpful for the, the uh, townspeople to accept uh, what it looks like is gonna be a pretty significant increase in their taxes. Because uh, there's, there's, there's definitely some confusion out there on that part. The only other thing, John, that I would suggest, I, I'm wondering if we can bond after the fact fees for the study. I think uh, I'd, I'd heard uh, that that was after the fact to be able to put that in a bond as opposed to put it into the construction. And, and maybe you've already gotten a legal opinion on that. That's what they're going to be doing with the 500,000 of it. Yeah. Um, you, the 250 is the upfront piece. And whether you could still include that in a bond, I don't know. I don't know to re try and recoup that. I don't. I don't know. But you'd have to still have to budget for it if you're going to do it. You have to have the cash before the bond to get the engineering done to float the bond. Yeah. So well, and, and if we, it's if it's in the budget, it's one thing. But can you actually put that in a bond after the fact? The so. two fifty or the no the five hundred. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. That is yeah. the plan. So yeah. we we. Um, we went up and we had a meeting with the architectural firm and the engineering firm and explained to them that we believe in this project. We do not have $750,000. We cannot put it in our budget this year. And are you willing to uh, have a, a creative conversation about possibilities? And they said they've never done anything like this. But we were suggesting, can we do a portion of it and pay for a portion up front and roll the balance over into the bond? And they said, well. That's a completely new concept for us. And um, they came back with us the next day with an offer that is incredible that they said, yes, we will give you a, um, a portion that we need up front because they're doing all this work. And the rest, we will let you bond it. And we believe so strongly in this project that you can pay the remainder of the balance in the bond. And if the bond does not pass, I just think this is worth saying again in case people didn't catch this, but if the bond doesn't get passed, we do not have to pay back that $500,000. They are willing to take that risk and they would eat that cost. So, so this is yeah, like my, my question is, win -win so they're willing process. to do that, mm -hmm. yes. but is it legally, have you got a legal opinion that you can actually put that money into a bond? Go ahead, Catherine. Thank yes, you. I've spoken to legal counsel earlier this week, and they said that it's perfectly acceptable to roll architect and engineering fees into the bond. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. So just, just a brief word to address some of what you said. I would agree with you. I think we could do a better job in communicating. The challenges when the defaults in explaining graphs is to maximize the change is visible. If you had a graph that actually had the lower access go to zero, you'd see how flat that curve really is because the percentage changes, even on those numbers, um, that slope that you look at, those percentage changes um, are all quite small year to year. Sherry Gustafson. Um, I have a couple questions. One is, um, I'm wondering if we're anticipating any um, 
settlement expenditures for teacher uh, or administrative um, uh, separation of ways going forward into the next fiscal year? Do we is this the question you asked earlier today? Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm wondering what's happening going forward, not what's happened in the past, but I'm just wondering if there's anything like oh, in the I next thought we answered year. it for you. That, that I'm not aware of any settlements going forward. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. I wasn't clear on that. And then the next question is, I'm wondering if, is there any, um, I'm, I'm really excited and nervous about the um, capital improvement stuff, and I'm wondering if there's any plans for any um, wooing any corporate kind of um, in-kind donations for like a, a playground or a, uh, an entrance way to the middle of the high school? And yeah. Yeah. Um, this first question um, was, was raised by um, people in the community to include some of our employees at Pond Cove. And uh, I explained that it would be important to go to the school board and ask for permission to do what you just said, to, to raise private funds to um, finish the project for the playground at Pine Cove because it's been pulled out of the budget. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I uh, hope that that, pull, that, that that request will come to the board perhaps in May or no later than June. My, I'm gonna, I don't know what the board's gonna say, but I, I'm, I'm gonna guess they're probably gonna say absolutely. And then there would be a, a, a way for people to perhaps um, uh, some kind of a tax um, uh, benefit could, could contribute toward right. this project and then hopefully finish it off in the next year. That'd be great. Okay, so I'll talk to the school board, approach them about that. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. I can say we really want to complete that project, yeah. right? <laughs> sure I mean, yeah. we've been in a lot of buildings and grounds committees and um, it's hard not doing it, but yeah. there were decisions that needed to yeah, be made understood. about this budget. And yeah, so absolutely. we, uh, not speaking for the board in general and as a whole, but um, I, I think yes, <laughs> informally saying we would welcome yeah, that to kind of creative financing yeah, of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Terry Patterson, um, I live on Surf Road. First, I want to say thank you. I know this has been a lot of work. Um, I'm the parent of two boys, uh, middle school and high school. Um, the piece that I'm most interested in here is the educational impact if this budget doesn't pass. And I think it's huge. I've been to several meetings, and what I've heard Howard say, and I think other people say, is that the impact is huge. Um, one of the words I heard was devastating. Um, a devastating impact on our kids' education. If that doesn't get anyone's attention, I don't know what does. The other piece that gets my attention is the $900,000 less that the state gave us this year. So to me, those two pieces are the big pieces that we're really talking about. I don't want to minimize or devalue the concern that we have the tax impact on our citizens. I think that's big, and I think it's absolutely part of the bigger picture. But we can't lose the devastating change in our education and the significant loss of funding from the state is also part of the picture. Um, I have a, so that's my statement. Um, I do have a question. One of the pieces I heard on Monday night at the council meeting, and I know there are a couple council members here, um, was about, well, when I learned about it, it was something called a circuit breaker program. But it's a program that's um, been talked about. It's been implemented in other towns. I know Scarborough is the town that they used as an example the other night. But it's a program to offset costs, to offset the tax burden for, um, Fixed income seniors is my understanding. I'm sure it's more technical than that. Um, to me, that sounds awesome. I mean, what a nice way to offset a tax increase for those that can afford it the least. I guess my question is, um, how likelihood is that that something like that could be in place? My take home on Monday was that it was fairly, I was optimistic that it was a real possibility. Um, I know that you're not the council and you can't answer that, but is your understanding that that's a reality that we can work toward as a school board or work toward as citizens or um, what piece of the puzzle, how can that help help move the budget forward? Yeah, so I would like to say that um, it was great to see that on the agenda Monday night with the town council that that conversation is happening. Um, it, did, it did sound hopeful from what I heard Monday night that uh, Mr. Sturgis said that it might be possible to be implemented by the fall. 
um, with some tweaking that there's already some very established programs out there that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can just sort of pick and paste and tweak it to work to ours. But that's really not under our jurisdiction at all. So if you do have specific questions about it, I would definitely um, talk to your town councils specifically. Um, so. Okay, thank but you. Thank you for bringing it out. So yeah. may I speak to this? So um, you know, I, I think it's um, words like devastating are, are relative and what I consider to be devastating someone else might call it something different and I respect that so uh, let me just explain what I meant by devastating um, at one point the school board was looking um, wanting to look at a, a a tax increase of about half of what we were looking at originally which was over 10 percent in terms of tax increase. And so I was asked to think about, um, at one point, 5.5% tax increase, and then something in between um, 10 and 5.5. And so I worked with the administration and to get some, somewhere between 10 and five, I, I forget where exactly we were, but we had identified at least um, six full-time positions in the district that would have to go. Those would be teaching and um, administrators. The, we, we do not have extra staff in, in, in anywhere. And we, we, we can't um, reduce the number of people that are driving buses. We, we, we are barely having enough drivers right now. We can't reduce cooks. We have barely have enough cooks. We can't reduce ed techs. We have no extra ed techs. Um, I mean, there are, are no extra p people to just, we could just lop off some people here. So it really gets down to programs and services. And when I started to look at the possibility next of after identifying um, six positions, which that is, um, that will make things different, but it, it won't be uh, devastating. But when you go down to get to 5.5, I believe I was looking at another nine positions. So nine plus six, that's 15. When you're going into 15 positions, first of all, you understand, here's your administration. You have two administrators in each building. Each building is about 550 kids in it. So to run schools of that size and to work with the students and work with the parents and work with the teachers and do evaluations and, and do uh, all that's, that, that's asked of you that most people don't really understand because you know it isn't your work. It's, a, it's, a, it's an all out job. So you, you can't have one person doing that and, and have it really function very well. So there aren't any building level administrators that can just be taken out. I can only think of central office. Uh, oh, oh, right. So here's your central office. You know, a lot of districts, like I, I read a while ago about Portland is going through the same struggle we are. And they took out a million dollars of administration and in, 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 they were asked to cut down to shave their budget by I believe $4 million, around numbers. The first million came out of administration. I don't have any idea, I didn't care to ask Javier what he did, but we don't have any mid-level administrators. Here's what you have. You've got a business manager, this lady here. You've got a superintendent, that would be me. You've got a special education director, and you've got a, dire a director of curriculum and instruction. That's it. And, I, I, and so if we have to cut administration, it's gonna come, I, I, as far as I can tell, from central office. There, there just isn't a, we have programs, Going back to um, the good question asked earlier tonight about the difference well, to explain you know, what is this essential programs and services and how does that relate to funding and all that that is a outdated, uh, unimpressive list of what things we ought to be offering our students as a minimum in Maine, it, and and. And, and so you have to, the state says, okay, how many kids do you have? Based on a very simple formula of kids and, and this, what they refer to as E, 
uh, PS, Essential Program and Services, there's this little math thing comes out that says, you've got to spend this much money as a minimum to get any support from the state. Well, most districts, certainly to include Cape Elizabeth, go well beyond that, which is absolutely to your credit. You've got, you're offering things here that are um, well beyond EPS. And you should be proud of it. I, I, you are proud of it. And it's gonna, we're gonna, if we take out 15 programs, let's just say that we wipe out one or two administrators, we still, have, I don't know what we're gonna do, but okay, let's, let's pretend we did that. We're still looking at, if we're gonna get down to 5.5 on tax rate, having to um, probably a minimum of 10 teaching positions. That is getting, ma'am, I'm finally getting there. That's where I think that it's getting drastic because it will not look like the district you have today. The programs that we offer that you're proud of, the students gain from, academically and socially and emotionally, are not gonna be the same. And I'm not trying to be an alarmist. It's just, you, it, you get my point. So that's why I say that I don't think you wanna go there. Mm -hmm. In the list of the, the cuts, I don't see anything that's a cut for that resource officer. So is the resource officer for the schools still in the budget? May, may I answer that? Yes. No. The, the, uh, at one point we had in our, our thinking midway, not initially, but midway into the process of looking at a budget, we decided, you know what, let's put a, a resource officer in this budget. And we thought that what seemed reasonable and fair would be to cost share that with the town. They have so many days of the officer working for them and so many days working for the school and we would, we would split that up. Then we had two people come and make a presentation to the school board, one who is a resource officer in Falmouth that's going to four officers next year in their school and one from Wells where they have I think one in the middle school and one in the high school. In both those communities, the town fully funds the school resource officers. So at this time when we're trying to reduce our cost, our feeling was, you know what, this isn't the time for us to add, add that to our budget. Um, it may be that the town can uh, afford this. We don't know, we'll find out. Um, also, there are some grants available this year because of all the sad um, killings and shootings in schools. The Maine is putting out a sizable amount of money to help schools uh, uh, improve their security. And one possibility may be to use that money to hire school resource officers. So in meeting with Chief Williams, he is waiting for some direction uh, from the town manager and town council, but one option would be that he continues to look for federal grants because th those come and go and, and perhaps fund this position through a federal grant, and if not, to look with us at the possibility of applying for a grant through the state of Maine. But right now, we did not any longer have that. Well, we never really had it in our budget. It was something that we thought made a lot of sense and it probably would have ended up there, but with, with what we're dealing with, it, 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 it no longer is there. It was taken out. Well, I think the citizens of this town have always had a pretty high willingness to pay for a good school district, and I think that's an item that, especially as you say, Howard, the sad things that have been going on in the oh. country, that I think it'd be something that we'd, we'd certainly love to see uh, uh, address one way or the okay. other. Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, if we were gonna spend money on just about anything, uh, the safety of the, the our students would be a very high priority. Thank so you, thank Thompson. you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just respond a little bit um, to the idea of an SRO officer. One of the uh, pieces that at least was informative for me when we had the SRO from Falmouth and the principal from, it was actually York, come speak, who has had this SRO officer in his district was the huge benefit of having um, a figure like that. He expressed it as an extension, another, how did he call it, administrative assistant, and that this, um, an administrative assistant, I think, in the sense that uh, this, this SRO officer does more than just respond in the unlikely event or the 
horrific event that could happen. This uh, officer is connecting with kids on a regular basis, making them feel seen, um, sort of filling in gaps, uh, building up the relationships that need to happen so that uh, we can avoid unfortunate events. So their job is much bigger than I ever understood it to be and much more beneficial than I ever understood it to be. It's not just simply to walk around with a gun and look for unwanted guests coming into the building um, at all. Their job is really to be another person there to support the children. Um, and they all need it at some level or another. I would just also recommend to you, if you want to go watch the video of the budget workshop where they came, in, uh, the SRO folks came and spoke, um, that would be great to see that. I think what you'll find there is that actually there was unanimous board support for that. That's something that we really do want. Um, there's a number of things that we wanted that just aren't in this year's budget. Um, this is, we just felt this was not the year. Um, as well as finding out that uh, for both of our guests, that was something that was funded by the town. In that context, we felt, again, this was not the year. I'm uh, Tom Dunham. <clears throat> I live at uh, 11 Becky School of Lane. I've lived in this town since 1976, except for a couple of years we've left. <clears throat> I thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts regarding the school board's decision to pass it over a 10% increase. I have attended two school board meetings. My understanding is 80% of the budget is salaries and benefits. One option discussed in one of those board meetings was to increase, increase the school class size. That was summarily dismissed. My suggestion is we look at increasing the size of, those, of the uh, classes. And in turn, given the history of declining enrollments, we should be able to um, have uh, a, <clears throat> a staff reduction. About four years ago, I spearheaded an effort to pursue competitive bidding for school employee benefits as well as the town. <clears throat> I was assured by professionals in, the, in that business that we would save immediately six, $600,000 a year savings. The same benefits, simply um, <clears throat> injecting market competitions on the um, insurance and salary benefits. Significant savings. And I suggest that the board look at that because that would <clears throat> offset um, a good portion of the lack of state funding. What troubles me the most is the mismanagement of taxpayers' monies due to the cited audit deficiencies. You, the board, have not earned my trust because of that. I strongly encourage that you retain an outside third-party educational consultant that everybody respects and have them um, evaluate the entire school system with the goal this year of achieving, and it's probably too late, um, a 3% budget increase. The other thing that troubles me is my understanding is <clears throat> I think we'll be paying off, I think it's around 27 million dollars in bonds. If, you know, it's a little uncanny for me. Or a little, if, it feels as though the board has, <clears throat> feels an entitlement to go back out and borrow another $25 million to <clears throat> uh, upgrade the schools. That just, it doesn't feel right to me because um, it's, it's unusual that those two numbers are so close. Thank you. Thank you. I would just add with respect to the uh, audit portion, there were two public meetings uh, held by the town council which school board members participated in that discussed the audit findings. Um, uh, I found them instructive. There was nothing there that we took lightly, but there was nothing uh, as a sort of repeat of what was said there. What had happened at the, all of those findings were some things that had been um, 
uh, happened previously and, and reached the level of significant findings. And that's not we're saying that, it, that, that um, that's something that we like, but it, it, it was, it was, this was not anything that was particularly new. It was headed in the wrong direction, and I think we took corrective actions, and um, now is the time to, to address that. I think the coming up with the town council meeting was delayed. The auditor was going to ex, uh, explain exactly what the, some of the corrective actions were. Um, as I had asked uh, at, at that meeting, um, the one that I attended, uh, part of the challenges in some of the, the issues that were identified is the uh, what occurs at management reporting level. Some of these things are not seen frequently enough, and that's one of the things that we had suggested that uh, be changing. So it, it's one thing to to uh, you have to do the right thing, but if you, if you to, and have controls, but if no one's looking at the controls, it doesn't really work. So that was one of the things that was uh, raised at those public meetings. Um, again, it's an um, uh, I, 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 since you have a specific you know, real concern about that, I wish that you had been able to attend those meetings where we discussed this in detail and had the auditors there to answer answer those questions, and I would encourage you to attend the uh, town council meeting with the auditor world ten. I believe it's, is that May 14th coming up? Uh, yes, thank you. Just a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. Sir, if I heard you correctly, uh, one of your suggestions was that you would, uh, or, or it was, an officer, it was a, uh, a point you wanted to make, is that you were hoping that maybe the budget could come in at 3%. Were you thinking of budget increase or were you thinking of tax rate increase? If you like, if you like historically, in the past five years, you, it's been increasing about 3% a year. On, so, on, on taxes? Okay. No, well, on taxes, it's overall taxes. Cape Elizabeth has been about 3% to include the school budget. Okay, thank you very much. Total. Thank you. And now it's quite a bit higher. You bet, thank you. Oh, gosh, yes. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to address the, um, when the school, when you say the state made a statement of uh, increasing the class sizes. Uh, I remember um, in that meeting that one of the uh, staff or teacher uh, stood up in that not all classes can be uh, increased just because some classes are already big, and Pacific science classes, biology classes, there's just physically not enough room right now for that space as well. So I just want to point that out. Mm -hmm. I'd like to also make a comment about class size because I think it is one of those things that I, it, there may have not been a mention of it in detail at the meetings that, that you were able to attend, um, but it did come up in several different points in the budget process. And I think that's part of what makes it a little hard for the public to follow because there's so many hours of a video to watch to be able to absorb everything that's being discussed and each point that we're, we're hitting on. So with respect to class size, we did, we, we, we asked the district, um, the administrators to, to tell us what, we're, what, what did we look like in class size for the middle school, Conco middle school and the high school. And then we compared it to the, the policy that we have. So we have a policy in place that says, we're, as a district, we're trying to stay within these certain parameters. And that was something that wasn't put in place lightly. It's part of our policy review that when we go through the policies uh, every every year or so often as we, we look at them. Um, and with respect to our class size at Pond Cove, we're within the parameters. At middle school, we're within the parameters of the board's recommendations within our policy. And at the high school, we're also within our parameters. To the extent we ever go outside of the policy, it has to go to the superintendent to be approved if we're going to go beyond you know, smaller or, great or, or greater. Um, so specifically at the high school, I think there's some, we made some changes, so there's a, there's a sheet that I think is part of the handout, but um, there's some specific cuts that we made when we tried to effectively sharpen our pencils, and, and Howard and the administrators went very carefully through the budget, and there are changes here that, that touch that issue. So it's not something that we, we summarily dismiss at all, I don't think that that's um, really a, 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 the complete picture. So. And I thought it would be good to sort of flesh that out and, and um, you know, so, give some backstory on the, on the decision. I'd like to one, add, add one more additional comment on class size. Um, is, is that something that we, we do consider it? But when, when I'll go back briefly to the policy change and the class size. Um, 
When we look at class size, we were trying to follow what we think is best practice that provides the most educational benefit. And um, there's data out there that it was, it was a prior board to me, but they had looked at this. And um, this was not a board that I was part of, but my understanding that um, you don't want to be too big and you don't want to be too small. And what they had previously had as a, cl as a class policy was a target, which was a number you would always miss. And if you went over it, it was sort of in that range. They put it in somewhere in, the, in that range and you would always miss it. And if you went over it, everyone was mad. And would you do anything about it? Well, really only if you were going to go over what, what was the, the, the maximum number where it would start to affect learning. So the policy was specifically changed to match, uh, not to change class sizes, but to match what we actually do, which is when you're out of this range, you want to know why you're out of that range and do you need to take action? Because if you are, you may be having an educational impact. Um, and so that's how the class size policy discussion evolved to be what it was in terms of a range where if you're out of the range, there are actions that are taken. It was not, there was no changes in class sizes that are resulted as a change in that policy. It just more accurately reflected what the board was actually doing and was related to the educational benefit of class size. I would like to uh, touch upon the, the bond of the 27 million. It's, the school is really not asking for a facelift. Um, the study has been done, and again, we had discussed it uh, in the videos many times, is that number one, security. If you look at, our, uh, look at all our schools, the front entrances, there's no blockage, there's no corridors, there's no security over there. So one of the uh, uh, improvement was to bring in security where we can block the entrances and have personnel there. And so there was a renovation around that. The other one, auditorium right now, kids are eating lunch in the auditorium at 10.30 in Pond Cove in middle school. And so one of the, one of the improvement was improving that, leaving us an auditorium and building a cafeteria. So it's not just a facelift or painting job. And I believe we, Howard can point to this, that there's a lot of stuff that's been cut already from the budget in reference to improvement of uh, certain rails or certain ramps and other stuff as well. So I just want to point that out as well. My name is Jim Sparks. I'm at 14 Woodcrest Road. I don't think I've ever heard the term mill rate before tonight, John, <laughs> so I have a question that may be sort of a stupid question, but um, it's, I understand that this state cut is connected to the rise in home valuations in Cape Elizabeth. Is that, is, is that correct? And I, and I would just it would be helpful just as a property tax payer, almost if there were a chart saying, okay, how much have our home valuations gone up and how does that relate to the state giving us less money? And my, I guess my follow-up would be, to what extent uh, is this going to be a consistent um, policy, state policy over time where there is this formula of the connection with our valuation and how much the state will give us and how would that shape planning? So the one good news is, is we've lost so much from the state, there's not much more to lose. <laughs> Got it. So that's the good news, right, John? <laughs> um, no, that, that, that's correct. I mean, at, at one point we had actually toyed with the idea of um, producing a budget that would be essentially at a minimum receiver um, so that all the fluctuations would then be come only in the form of tax refunds <laughs> so that so that the you would either get a small refund or a big refund depending on what the state funding was because it's so uh, somewhat unreliable and as I said th there's a formula but they tweak the formula in little ways every year there are about probably 20 different knobs that you can turn on that Got it. Um, and, and sort of, um, you know, perhaps more when instead of expand what is in, included in different buckets. Um, it, it is relatively complex. It is somewhat difficult to plan to, but not impossible. I think we could do a better job of anticipating what some of that is. I think the other thing that is, um, for, for at least speaking for myself, I think um, uh, encouraging a change in the calendar. Um, and uh, the uh, w addressing the 
size, allowable sizes of fluctuations mm -hmm. um, at the state level would be a huge benefit to not only this district, but many districts, sure. because uh, the numbers always come late. Um, and often after you've already passed your budget is finally adjusted and this helps nobody really um, and so uh, and there's I don't understand that there's any good reason for that calendar so also just want to thank you for all the work you've all put in in a difficult year So this meeting was scheduled for an hour from six to seven. Uh, it is just about seven right now. And um, I wanna say on behalf of the board, those of us that are here, and I know those who could not make it tonight, we're very appreciative for your questions, your inquiries, your interest. Um, and I don't want to not include anybody else. If somebody else has something that they'd like to say, I'd like to give one last opportunity. Otherwise, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, so. I guess this is last call. <laughs> All right, we'll see no questions again. Thank you so much for being here. If you do have more questions, this is an open process. Please uh, feel free to email the school board at any time. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.